If you attempt to share your published genealogy with your family that only has names, dates, and places, is it any wonder nobody wants to read what you produced? <laughs> to generate interest in your stories and have relatives asking for their own copies, wrap the genealogy facts with social history. Social history details how ancestors lived, worked, prayed, played, and interacted with their community. Howdy, my name is Devin Noel Lee. If you're new here to write your family histories, I hope you learn how to quickly write non-boring family histories. And social history is what we're gonna talk about today, and it really can impact your story in a dramatic way. And it's really not that hard to do. When you add social history into your ancestor stories, you can easily turn a dull manuscript into an engaging story. The following steps will help you begin the process now. Just remember to start adding social history to your rough draft. As you revise each draft, experiment with adding different elements of your social history. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't, take it out. But you won't know how awesome your story will become until you add the details about the daily lives of your ancestors to your manuscript. As genealogists, we regularly research records to find evidence to identify our ancestors, events in their life, whom they're related to, and descriptions that separate them from someone else with the same name. When we research social history, we do not look for resources with our ancestors' names on them. When we research social history, we do not look for resources with our ancestors' names on them. Instead, we research the location, dates, and world around our ancestors. For example, we research the following. Towns lived in for customs, laws, amenities, geography, climate, newsworthy events, economics, transportation options, technology, and more. Schools they attended for educators, administrators, activities, amenities, buildings, fellow students, noteworthy events, and so on. For religious observance, we look for the customs, the beliefs, the leaders, the buildings, and anything else that will help us understand religious worship. When we research occupation, we look for skills needed, hours worked, financial compensation, products made or services offered, co-workers, and bosses. When we research culture, we look for entertainment offerings, taboo topics, behavior standards, courting practices, favored groups, stereotypes, negative group interactions, social ranking, fashion, ethnic heritage, language, association, medical treatments, care for the poor, and the list goes on. When we research governments, we research leaders, laws, social movements, political associations, criminality, military units, violent conflicts, taxes, and more. Often, this social history is gathered in books and periodicals specific to a location and its time. For example, county and military unit histories often curate data about all the social history topics into one resource. However, the relevant resources for the above topics include history books and blogs, historic newspapers, diaries and letters from community members, statues, religious decrees, and pamphlets. If you feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start, Lynn Palermo has a gateway of relevant resources to get you started in researching social history. However, one of my favorite idea generating resources is Wikipedia. Review the details about your ancestor's life and then research those topics on Wikipedia. For example, I discovered that my grandpa Lou was a huge Ohio State football fan and worked part-time as a stadium usher. While researching the football team and the famous Horseshoe Stadium, I discovered that construction of the facility began the year grandpa was born. I then wove the history of the Ohio State football team and the stadium into grandpa's story and my relatives thought it fit perfectly. While researching social context, do not overlook anything because you don't think it will fit. It's better to have too much initially and then not include it than to have too little and write a boring family history. Two techniques will help you include social history into your ancestor's story. The first 
technique is called Describe As You Go. This technique does what the name suggests. Defining anything that may seem unfamiliar to your readers as you tell a story. This includes terminology such as slang, idioms, and the words that describe objects that a reader doesn't use or has not experienced. For instance, these are words from England and Ireland that few Americans use, or we'd use a word like trainer very differently. Since I attended Texas A&M University, one of my favorite annual traditions is Aggie Muster. To folks who've never heard of it, I need to explain the experience, especially since Muster can mean a formal event on the A&M campus or various gatherings around the globe. Sometimes places need explaining because those places no longer exist, like Astro World in Houston. Some places have odd names, like the Quack Shack for the student clinic at Texas A&M University. Other places have unflattering names like Stingadina. I'll let you guess where that is located. You might need to describe customs and behaviors. Whenever you plan a trip to a foreign country, you strive to learn proper customs and behaviors to respect that place. We should do the same when visiting our ancestors. For instance, when writing about a bobsled in my Canadian ancestor stories, we could write something like this. While waiting for her cousin at the train station, a friendly gentleman arrived in a wooden wagon set on metal skis rather than wheels. He knew Catherine's relatives well and was heading in their direction. Since Catherine had waited three hours for her kin, she leapt at the opportunity to leave the cold and continue her journey towards her confined pregnant cousin. As she grasped the neighbor's hand and boarded the bobsled, she prepared herself for the bumpy ride across the icy snow. Notice how I've defined a bobsled as a wagon with skis rather than wheels that cause a bumpy ride. In short, a bobsled was probably named by an engineer, a sled wagon that bobs. As a side note, the engineer versus marketing debate happens regularly in my home, and we're not alone in the battle to name things. Anyway, when you describe as you go, you avoid stopping and inserting a definition. This approach abruptly disrupts the flow of reading. Few members of your audience will appreciate it. The next technique works best for helping to describe the settings for events in your ancestors' lives. It's best applied when you introduce a new scene in your overall story. For instance, I often use headlines, pop culture, and world events to introduce a birth, marriage, death, or other major life milestone or change. Thus, I start at a high level, then I zoom in a little closer, and then I arrive at the scene of my ancestor's life event. A daughter joined the home of 34-year-old Jesse Tame and 30-year-old Elizabeth Orton. After zooming in, you can now describe the scene as you continue identifying the name of the daughter and move on about her birth. Newspapers block the windows of the Tame family home. The headlines for the Salt Lake Tribune screamed gross back sentence to a prison term. What headline would an editor craft had they known Elizabeth's secret that she had hid from her best friend and her entire community? Do you see all the historical context woven into a story about a birth that surprised the friends and family of Jesse and Elizabeth Tame? The surprise she kept from her best friend. Can you now see how you can leverage the zoom in and describe as you go techniques to incorporate social history into a birth story? If you can, use these techniques in your family story and tell me how much they transform it. Before we continue, if I've given you value during this video, please click the like button and subscribe to this channel. Then leave a comment or a question about your struggles or successes with writing family history. Many educators invite you to consider your ancestors more typical than unique. They are special to you, but they likely participated in behaviors typical of the time and place. The advantage of this advice is you can then incorporate historical events, customs, clothes, household items, and so forth into your ancestor's story, even if you do not know specifically how they behaved, where they worked, how they worked, and what they owned. However, 
never infer what your ancestor possessed, believed, wore, or did. An extreme example would involve assuming your ancestor condoned slavery simply because they lived in the antebellum South. It's possible that a child of a slave owner was an abolitionist. Without documentation proving the fact, we can neither confirm nor refute that possibility. But we can also neither confirm nor deny that they were wholly invested in the practice of slavery either. On a smaller scale, don't presume they did what everyone else did for the same reason. They may have baptized their children in the same church, but that doesn't mean they believe the same religious tenets. Perhaps the church was the only one for miles around and your ancestors believed in the ritual of baptism. In short, Close was better than correct. Once you write a rough draft about your ancestors, enhance the stories with social histories. You don't have to be creative or talented as a writer to add context to your story. But by adding details about the world in which your ancestor lived, your stories are more meaningful and enjoyable. You can do this. Remember to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe. Then go watch this video that will help you continue on your family history writing journey.